Hey everybody, welcome to this and extra slice. I haven't done one in a little while and I thought after the passage we've just had on Ephesians that it might be really helpful because uh, it's a, such a big passage and slightly controversial in some places. So if you haven't been to one of our extra slices before, we go try and go a little bit deeper than we do in the sermon. Uh, I go quite quickly. Um, I don't plan these. I just read through the scriptures and go, oh, let's chew on this and a little better. Um, and it enables people to get go a bit deeper. So in the sermon, I talk quite a lot about spiritual warfare and um, I, because it's such a controversial topic, I try to hedge around it so that you sort of people don't get freaked out when I, when I even start talking about it, um, rather than going into much of the detail in the passage at all um, or the wider context of Ephesians. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of that now for us. So Ephesians uh, is written to people in Ephesus. It's what's called a prison letter. So Paul seems to himself be in chains at this time that he's actually writing. Um, later on, uh, does he say, yes, pray that I may, uh, for which I'm an ambassador in chains, verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 20. So he's literally in chains when this is being uh, written. Now, if we remember Ephesians, we can read back about the church being planted in Ephesians. Uh, in the book of Acts and uh, when he travels to Ephesus and it's uh, the city has got a temple huge temple to Artemis I believe it was um, and this um, sense that uh, there's a great spiritual atmosphere in the city so there's a great sort of conflict between um, the gods and that sense of the gods being behind everything is very very clear uh, for the people in Ephesus and so when Paul's writing this stuff, he's not having to go through all the layers of like, yeah, but do demons exist? And what do I think about powers and principalities? Because actually this stuff is just right close to the surface for them. They're thinking about it much, much more than we probably are on a daily basis. Um, now, one of the things that comes out in this passage really interestingly is how do we identify the rulers, the authorities against the powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil? Um, now, there's been a debate in contemporary theology, um, particularly around uh, a gentleman called Walter Wink, who's been highly influential, and trying to describe these powers and principalities, not so much as um, uh, to do with what we might normally think of as spiritual things, but embedded in structures which are oppressive in some kind of ways. So um, this has been really influential for lots of um, uh, lots of writers who wanting to say take on racism, which would say that there's a there's an embedded level of evil in the structures of our world, which maintains structures which will um, hurt and hurt and hurt people, particularly of um, different ethnicities or or something along those lines and, and that's been then used by different scholars to talk about um, uh, uh, whatever groups have been uh, oppressed in different ways and that the structures the principalities the powers aim at keeping those peoples down um, and so the the sense of the battle against them then becomes about trying to change some of the structures in um, that we see out there in the wider world now, I think that's really interesting, and I think you can get there um, with Paul without too much difficulty. And I want, I think, especially when we look at then um, the book of Revelation and the, the, the oppressive forms, forces of, of empire there, um, then the sense that there is genuine evil embedded in our structures is, I think it's got a lot of truth to it. And I think what we've seen, whatever you make of uh, movements like Black Lives Matters in the last couple of years, I think the general complaint that people are wanting to say, which is, we have structures in our world which are keeping people down that need to be broken and need to be changed and repented from. I think we can probably go there as Christians. Now, the question I think we're asking ourselves here in Ephesians is not so much whether that's true, because I believe it is. There are things that need changing. Hallelujah. Come kingdom of God. Break those things open. Is that, is that the question we have to ask ourselves in Ephesians if, is if that's the primary sense that Paul brings to this. Um, and my, my sense is probably not, um, not because I don't agree with those things. I hope that's made, made clear. But because I think given the um, given the febrile spiritual atmosphere within Ephesus and given the number of times Paul within this same letter talks about forces of darkness um, that aren't just structures, that they are sort of more 
personal spiritual forces. I think those are his main aim uh, there. Now, I um, I think it's really interesting as well. So that's that's a whole kind of really interesting topic, and you could people students would write essays on that kind of thing. Um, what's also really interesting, it just struck me uh, just the other day that when Paul talks about putting on this armour. And when I was a little boy, this passage was a favourite um, in our household, but it was also a favourite in the churches I was going to at the time. And sometimes we'd describe it and we'd say, you know, put on your helmet of salvation in the morning and put your belt of truth on. Uh, and I remember as a young Christian doing that, you know, in the morning, and as I was praying, I'd, I'd sort of uh, metaphorically put on the armour of God, if you like. But what's really interesting, I think, is if you look through those different aspects of the armour, so what have we got here? We've got um, uh, truth uh, with the belt, we've got breastplate of righteousness, uh, shoes of peace and shield of faith and helmet of salvation. I was trying to think through what are the parallels within our scripture of where those sorts of lists of things come from. And I think what's really striking about them is that they are not they're not very similar to what we might call the virtue lists or the, the list of things that people often do that are good so love joy peace patience you know fruits of the spirit things like that or you know dwell on those things which are holy and right then they aren't actually in those categories they are more they're they're all what we might call gifts they're all gifts so truth for example truth isn't something we work up ourselves truth is something we've received by the revelation of god to us which which keeps us firm righteousness such a key theme in um in paul's writings especially you know righteousness not from our own not something we develop but a gift of righteousness which uh protects us which gives us that firmness peace again peace that surpasses all understanding comes from philippians but but that only comes through the gospel it's that gospel peace and that deep place of knowing who you are uh, who you belong to that brings that sort of peace and then finally even faith uh, and salvation of course are gifts from god they're not something we work up ourselves they are defensive but defensive gifts that we receive um and then you know of course even the offensive weapon then this sword um get a pen for you the sword uh even the offensive weapon actually really interesting also is a gift the word of god that's come to us so when we're thinking about spiritual warfare it's never something about us why because the battle is already won brothers and sisters uh the devil and all his enemies are either always defeated my friend used to love saying this i think he nicked it from c.s lewis again um and he said that uh the, the the demonic forces in uh in in the world we do see we do see them but they're a bit like japanese soldiers that have been found in the forest years after the war has ended and it's not that they need to to lose the battle because the battle's already been won they just need to be reminded of the truth which is that the war has already been won and that they haven't got a fight to fight anymore the, 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 the works of the enemy are always disruption, they're always chaos, they're always manipulation and, and under undermining things. Um, so we don't need to feel like we are taking on a battle. Every battle in the scriptures is always the Lord's. And if you are feeling oppressed today, you're feeling like, I, I just, there's something against me something against me i feel like i'm just messed up and i'm confused with this stuff and you know sometimes we get messages from people like that saying help me i feel like i'm in a mess get yourself to to either this church or wherever it is you attend and ask for prayer pray in the spirit on all occasions paul says because these things are not your battle they're not your battle and when you receive that it's not your battle when you receive that actually this is the lord's fight and it's only with his armor it's only with his weapons that we might be able to ever compete um that actually things get us a whole lot easier and suddenly you don't find yourself trying to battle the whole uh, armies of hell but you find yourself actually saying lord this is your battle lord this is your way because in the end in the end don't take anything else take this in the end it all goes back to jesus it all leads back to the lord if it doesn't lead back to the lord then we're getting distracted and the enemy's work is succeeding Friends, I really hope you've enjoyed this extra slice. Um, I uh, uh, God bless you, and I'll see you again for another one soon. Bye-bye.